A new page of American history is inscribed in the nation's capital as President Lyndon Baines Johnson leaves the White House to take the oath for his first full term as 36th President of the United States. Accompanied by his wife and followed by the new Vice President and Mrs. Hubert Humphrey, the President today fulfills a dream that many aspire to but few attain. Flanked by secret servicemen in stringent security arrangements, the President's car leads a cavalcade to the steps of the Capitol, the historic site of the inaugural ceremonies. Mr. Johnson was returned to office by the most overwhelming vote in history, a mandate to the Texan, who succeeded to the office in the wake of the tragedy in Dallas. Now, this is President Johnson's hour. He becomes President of the United States in his own right. take the oath is Hubert Horatio Humphrey, who fills an office that has been vacant since President Kennedy's assassination. The oath is administered by Speaker of the House John McCormick, who until this moment was next in line to succeed to the presidency. An embrace for his wife from the new Vice President. Then the solemn moment that marks the continuity of the President's office. Chief Justice Warren administers the oath as Mrs. Johnson establishes an historical precedent. For the first time, a president's wife holds the Bible, a gift from his mother, as Mr. Johnson is sworn in. Will to the best of your ability. And will to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help you God. Then President Johnson's inaugural address. It proves to be one of the shortest in the nation's history. In it, Mr. Johnson bids the United States to dedicate itself to justice for all and to end tyranny and misery. It was a speech that was more philosophical than specific, aimed at projecting the targets and hopes of the new administration. In part, he said, We can never again stand aside prideful in isolation. Terrific dangers and troubles that we once called foreign now constantly live among us. Yep. American lives must end and American treasure be spilled in countries that we barely know, then that is the price that change has demanded of conviction and of our enduring covenant. Our nation's course is abundantly clear. We aspire to nothing that belongs to others. We seek no dominion over our fellow man. But man's dominion over tyranny and misery. The address was hailed by both parties as a fitting statement of the nation's abiding principles and goals, with objectives as lofty as the great banner that cloaks all proud and patriotic Americans today. Then the president leads the inaugural parade along Pennsylvania Avenue as he returns to the White House reviewing stand. An estimated million people watched the parade, one of the shortest of inaugural pageants. At the president's request, there was no hardware, no tanks or missiles or spacecraft. Each of the 50 states had a float in the parade. This commemorates Mrs. Johnson's whistle-stop campaign tour in those hectic days before the election. They enjoy every moment of their hour of triumph in a good old Yankee Doodle tradition.
president and his party stay to the very end. And what more appropriate theme to climax this record than Mr. Johnson's Texas Ranch? This is where the long trail to the White House began. May this symbolize an ever new beginning for a greater republic under Lyndon Baines Johnson, President of the United States. This is Play Coup. 250 miles north of Saigon, the air base that was ripped by Vietnamese communist guerrillas. Eight Americans died in the attack that brought swift retaliation by U.S. and South Vietnamese forces. From carriers and land bases, 49 jets struck back at staging areas just across the border in North Vietnam. The Red guerrillas were able to slip by Vietnamese guards in the middle of the night raid and lob mortar shells into the area, while hand-carried bombs were placed under aircraft and against barrack walls. Why security was so lax is the object of two investigations. Although some officers say full protection against such attacks is impossible in this jungle war, there is mute evidence of the toll the guerrillas took here. First official word of the retaliatory attacks comes from Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara in a briefing for newsmen. The map shows the relative position of three carriers attached to the 7th Fleet, as well as the three U.S. bases that were hit by the Viet Cong. This is what followed. Immediately following the attack, U.S. representatives in Saigon met with representatives of the South Vietnamese government. They jointly agreed that joint retaliatory action was required. The President's approval of this action was given after the action was discussed with and recommended by the National Security Council at a meeting held between 7.45 p.m. and 9 p.m. last night. Mr. McNamara said that the raiding U.S. jets hit Dong Hoi barracks, where most red troops are equipped for their forays to the south. In the first raid, land-based planes were forced back by the weather, but the carrier jets completed their strike with the loss of one American plane. Later, photo reconnaissance flights proved that much of the staging area had been completely destroyed. The confrontation between the Reds and the West was the most critical since the Gulf of Tonkin incident last summer, when the U.S. replied just as swiftly to North Vietnam PT boat attacks. The second raid came the next day, when the South Vietnamese pilots struck anew at bases across the border. Here again, a successful mission was carried out as the Red Communication Center at Vinh Lin was bombed and strafed. Both Beiping and Moscow were slow to comment on these retaliatory raids. Finally, they both promised to back the North Vietnamese regime. Asian reaction, however, was that the two Red Powers had lost face in the East-West showdown. To bolster defenses in South Vietnam, a Hawk ground-to-air missile unit has gone on duty. Meanwhile, President Johnson's special assistant for security affairs, McGeorge Bundy, arrives at the scene of the Viet Cong raid. He was in Vietnam on a mission for the president when the attacks took place, and he holds a battlefront conference with Lieutenant General Khan before returning to Washington. While he conferred with Vietnamese officials, the National Security Council was meeting in Washington. It was these meetings that brought the swift decision to strike back at the Viet Cong to re-emphasize our resolve to continue to defend the cause of freedom in Southeast Asia. Before leaving for home, Mr. Bundy flew to the 8th Field Hospital to visit the men wounded in the guerrilla attack. 108 men were wounded, 79 of them seriously. Mr. Bundy was to say later that he found morale high among the men a factor that the president says our enemies always underestimate. Mr. Bundy arrives back in Washington the next day, and he immediately goes into conference with the president and the Security Council. He tells reporters that he found political and religious factions in Vietnam united in their belief that the Viet Cong is their common enemy. When we had an opportunity to talk frankly and freely uh, with them, they again emphasized uh, the overriding importance in South Vietnam of the contest against the communists. They emphasized, as the political leaders had done, the importance and their own dedication to 
uh, the importance of and their dedication to the task of forming a stable and effective political society under a stable and effective government uh, in that country, uh, a view which, of course, uh, we share. And uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, the Americans in Vietnam are in very good heart and are prepared to continue even against this kind of danger and this kind of sneak attack. Let me say one more thing about that uh, sneak attack, that in a war of this kind, in which uh, there are no fixed lines, in which there are large territories that are lightly inhabited and that are essentially jungle and mountainous in character, uh, I know no military man who believes that with, without an overwhelming assignment of local defense forces, it is possible to guarantee against this kind of sneak attack. Uh, this is the sort of thing, and all Americans in the area know it, uh, with which we simply have to contend while we prosecute in uh, company with the government and people of South Vietnam a contest against communism, which is of the highest importance to our uh, national interest. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara points to bombed out supply routes from North Vietnam. Routes that have supplied Reds in the South with weapons, like this Chinese machine gun, as well as troops trained by the communists. Discounting the possibility of using nuclear weapons, Mr. McNamara says that our air raids have knocked out 24 key bridges. He says these strikes will continue because intelligence reports have confirmed that regular North Vietnam Army troops have infiltrated the South. He specified men of the 325th Division. I can't be too specific or accurate in estimating the size of that uh, battalion. I would guess it's on the order of four or 500 men. Uh, as to its significance, I think it's primarily significant in indicating that the North Vietnamese have used up or dried up the source of, of individual fillers who could be recruited, trained, and sent back to fight in South Vietnam, and that they're now having to call upon the regular units of their forces for that purpose. And this is understandable. I believe I'm correct in saying that in the past four and a half years, the Viet Cong, the communists, have lost 89,000 men killed in South Vietnam. Now, not all of these men have been infiltrated from the North, but an important number have been. And with that, plus the expansion of the Viet Cong forces in the South, you can see the heavy drain upon the filler resources of the North and the reason why they are having to turn to their regular military units to continue the supply of men over these infiltration routes, a supply that's absolutely essential to them if they are to offset the continuing casualties. The military junta. The rebels claim the constitutional president is Francisco Comaño Deño with the bullhorn, a professional soldier who trained at marine bases in the U.S. and at the officer school in Virginia. He says that he began planning eight months ago for the overthrow of the then ruling junta to pave the way for the return of ousted president Juan Bosch. But the colonel himself was elected by Congress, he says, after Mr. Bosch declined to return. Camaño, in turn, is opposed by the troops loyal to a new three-man military junta headed by General Antonio Barreras. It appears that only the presence of upwards of 35,000 U.S. Marines, soldiers, and Navy personnel has kept this power struggle from erupting anew into a shooting war. Meanwhile, the United States is channeling its manpower on the island toward humanitarian chores. A shuttle service has been put into effect to ferry badly needed food to the islands from the U.S. A quarter of a million pounds of food are being distributed daily without regard to political philosophy. U.S. troops are handing out the supplies at 10 points, which are changed every few days to assure an equitable distribution. Included are rice, beans, flour, and powdered milk, solace for a people torn by civil war.
president reaffirms United States policy in South Vietnam in a talk to the Association of American Cartoonists. These social satirists hear Mr. Johnson describe Red China as a hungry tiger ready to devour all of Asia, using North Vietnam as a cat's paw. Their target is not merely South Vietnam. It is Asia. Their objective is not the fulfillment of Vietnamese nationalism. It is to erode and to discredit America's ability to help prevent Chinese domination over all of Asia. In this domination, they shall never succeed. And I am continuing and I am increasing the search for every possible path to peace. The president visualizes a peaceful, prosperous Vietnam once the fighting can be brought to an end at the conference table. He outlined past aid to South Vietnam since it became independent in 1954 and extended a hand to the communist north to partake of the fruits of what could be peaceful progress with a billion dollar assistance program. He called on the Soviet Union to join with other industrial nations to assure Vietnam's progress. Our efforts in war or peace will continue, he said, and he looked toward tomorrow. It will be there when peace comes to us. And so will we, not with soldiers and planes, not with bombs and bullets, but with all the wondrous weapons of peace in the 20th century. And then perhaps together, all of the people in the world can share that gracious task with all the people of Vietnam, North and South alike. Is Claudia the 18 story Saturn I stands on its pad at Cape Kennedy, poised to send Pegasus II into orbit. The world's most powerful rocket lights up the landscape as it generates its million and a half pounds of thrust. The Pegasus II follows a twin into orbit. Pegasus I and II are measuring the density of meteoroids. This is important data to have collated before we send our astronauts far out into space, much further than the current project, Gemini 1. Animation shows how the Pegasus goes through its paces once the hydrogen-powered second stage puts it into orbit an orbit ranging from 316 to 460 miles high. When the satellite is comfortably in place, it goes into action on its own to thrust out wing-like panels to a span of 96 feet. These will measure the damage tiny meteoroids might cause as they hit a spacecraft with sandblast effect while they speed through the reaches of outer space. President Charles de Gaulle makes a five-day tour of France through four departments, and he makes it under stringent security provisions. Ever since he assumed power, de Gaulle has walked in the shadow of assassins. The extremist groups that railed against the settlement in Algeria have stalked de Gaulle since he was elected president in 1958. As this tour was drawing to a close, 11 extremists were rounded up by his security forces, including two high police officers responsible for his safety. De Gaulle shrugs off these attempts on his life with Gallic fatalism, though he does take the precaution of surrounding himself with bodyguards. 4,000 men were on duty during his short tour. At saint gilles he finds time to greet the fishermen just like an old-time campaigner. This is not supposed to be a political trip, but de Gaulle faces a coming election, and it pays to get around a bit. Homage is paid to the legendary Georges Clemenceau at saint hermine The tiger, as it was called, is a de Gaulle hero. 
In a score of speeches he made during the five days, de Gaulle unfailingly attacked the world leadership of the U.S. and the Soviet Union in the West and the East. He wants France in the foreground as the power in Europe. The 75-year-old de Gaulle has not yet announced his candidacy for re-election with a coyness that hardly befits his years. However, if he fails to run, it would be like a Frenchman giving up his beloved wine for soda pop. Impossible. Some added punch for Uncle Sam in South Vietnam. At Bayonne, New Jersey, four 82-foot Coast Guard cutters are loaded aboard a cargo ship to sail for duty against the communist Viet Cong. The 63-ton vessels will be used for coastal and river operations in the areas of South Vietnam, where the North Vietnamese have been smuggling arms to the Viet Cong. Speedy and maneuverable, the cutters have been refitted and their armaments increased. They will form a barrier along the coast to prevent the landing of Chinese arms in remote coves and isolated beaches. They will be the new policemen on the beat. Once the helicopter was looked upon as a slow but reliable workhorse. No more. At Oxnard, California, they unveiled new refinements on the Army Lockheed XH-51A. The craft goes aloft with test pilot Donald Segner at the controls for this first public demonstration. In one recent flight, the same pilot flew the chopper at an incredible 272 miles an hour. Today, he sort of loafs. In a couple of zooming runs, Segner sends the copter along at a mere 240 miles an hour. It's the beginning of another new era in aviation. The Chelsea Flower Show on the grounds of the Royal Hospital in London is the largest in the world, they say. And each year, it is a monument to man's ability to predict nature. The Horticultural Society managed to have the blooms at their loveliest, no matter the weather, for visitors like Princess Margaret. Queen Elizabeth was in Germany during the exhibit, so it became Margaret's privilege to make this into a royal bower. The Queen Mother is also an attentive viewer of all this beauty. Three and a half acres of blooms right in the heart of London. The beauty of the flowers is almost enough to discourage the amateur gardener, but he goes home determined to do as well in his own backyard. To paraphrase those two incomparable English balladeers, the flowers that bloom in the spring fella have plenty to do with the case. One of the leading figures of our time is dead. Bernard Baruch, whose favorite office in later years was a park bench, was a quiet philanthropist who gave away the millions he accumulated as a financier and Wall Street broker. He was appointed by President Truman to the Atomic Energy Commission. And at one of the early meetings of the United Nations, he came to make an impassioned plea for all nations to ban nuclear weapons as a means of war. He addressed the Security Council with his now famous statement, we are here to make a choice between the quick and the dead. That is our business. His plan was not adopted, but he was ever the advisor to presidents. President-elect Eisenhower and Prime Minister Churchill met in his New York apartment to renew a wartime friendship. From President Wilson to President Kennedy, he was a frequent caller at the White House, where his advice was sought in many areas of international concern. He was honored as few men are in their own lifetimes. A housing development in New York City was named for the man who devoted most of his life to public service. He was a man esteemed by all of his countrymen. The Russians scored a propaganda coup at the International Air Show in Paris, but the U.S. came right back by showing two aces. President Johnson's plane arrives at Louberger Airport with Vice President Humphrey and astronauts McDivitt and White aboard. 
the Space Twins were asked to make the trip by the President in an obvious move to offset the Russian display at the show. The Soviets had flown in the world's largest plane, a craft that had caught the attention of the crowds. Now, however, the presence of the Gemini Twins is causing plenty of comment, and they steal the show at the French Air Industry Association luncheon. On hand is Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, and he is engulfed by autograph seekers, but so are the Americans. McDivitt comments that this is harder work than piloting Gemini 4 around the world. Gemini twins came, saw, and conquered at the Paris Air Show. A religious revival has taken over the Houston Astrodome home of baseball and football as Billy Graham welcomes President Johnson to his crusade for Christ. The president flew from his Texas ranch for the services, attended by 61,000 people, 10,000 more than the stadium's capacity for a sports event. From a special box, Mr. Johnson looks down on the huge throng. In the 10 days of appearances, Dr. Graham has drawn nearly 700,000 to the Astrodome. While a scoreboard carries the message from the Bible, the religious leader touches on the demonstrations by opponents of the administration's policies in South Vietnam. He said, one way to gain attention today is to organize a march and protest something. Adding, even a handful can make a great noise. After the meeting, Mr. Johnson has a word of congratulations for the popular religious figure.